Uh, thank you again for joining us. And at this point, I'll turn things over to Atul. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate you doing that. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted on behalf of the IOP governance chapter to be a moderator for this excellent panel that we have. So now, often when we think about opportunities, uh, particularly around sourcing, a lot of attention gets paid to opportunities and not enough to risk management. And so what we thought today we would do is bring two experts that focus significantly on sourcing and enterprise risk management as they think about sourcing. So I'm delighted to have today two executives from Wellington Management. We have Jennifer Duest, who's the Vice President of Global Corporate Insurance and Third Party Risk Management. She leads a team that partners with business at our company to help mitigate risks that are associated with third party vendor relationships. And this includes the areas of vendor selection, due diligence, ongoing risk management, and oversight. She's also responsible for the administration and oversight of the firm's global insurance program. Prior to joining Wellington in 2016, Jen was at MFS Investment Management for almost 10 years. Again, her last role there was the VP of Enterprise Risk Management. And prior to that, she was the head of treasury operations for Converse. So really significant experience in enterprise risk management. Along with her is Marsha Eimer, who's a vice president, enterprise sourcing, again, at Wellington Management. And she focuses, again, on a partnership with the business areas to help mitigate risk with third-party vendor relationship, including the areas of vendor selection, due diligence, contract negotiation, and ongoing risk management and oversight. Prior to Wellington, Marsha was a client advisor at Marsh. And Jennifer and Marsha, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Thank you so much. Along with, thank you, thank you. Along with Jennifer and Marsha, I also have John Bree. John is a Senior Vice President of Supply Wisdom, which is a risk monitoring offering from Neo Group. So, let me, without any further ado, start the session, and I encourage all participants that are on this line, please use the Q&A button at the bottom or the chat button to either share your comments and or ask questions, and I'm going to try and see if I can have the panelists answer them as we go along. With that, let's launch into our first slide. Thank you so much. We appreciate the opportunity to speak um, to you guys today. So we thought um, we would anchor our presentation around the third party risk sourcing life cycle. The way we think about a life cycle is continuous. It never really ends. And we'll go into more detail on each of these points in the upcoming slides, but it really starts with planning and, um, and making sure the planning is done at an appropriate level based on the um, based on the needs of the business. And then we go into due diligence where applicable and we'll talk through when and when that's not applicable. Um, I'll follow with the contract and onboarding and, and the contract, a lot of times the contract negotiation can happen in parallel with the due diligence. And then we go into ongoing monitoring and reporting followed by um, either renewal or termination of the relationship. So once again, we'll go into more detail on each of these slides, um, on each of the points in the upcoming slides. So with respects to planning, it's really critical um, that planning is done appropriately in order to set the rest of the phases up for success. And particularly with firms where there's less formality about how and when to engage procurement and third party risk, the planning is really um, crucial aspect of the of the entire life cycle and so we think about planning um, if we're going to be onboarding perhaps a new vendor um, it's critical to have a seat at the table as early as possible when the business is first thinking about bringing on a new vendor because we can help influence whether or not an RFP is appropriate for those firms that have supplier diversity programs it's an opportunity to bring a, di a diverse supplier into the mix um, we also want to have a seat at the table early in the conversation if the business is thinking about changing their scope um, because that could have implica implications on the existing contract terms 
as well as we might need additional due diligence based on the type of activity and the change in scope. And then we also think it's beneficial to include third party risk and procurement sourcing with respect to vendor termination. Many times the business doesn't realize that um, there are specific perhaps notice requirements that have to be um, that have to be followed prior to terminating the vendor. There's also um, considerations with respects to transition services of the outgoing vendor. So in order to um, in order to have the vendor termination um, go as smoothly as possible, it's just important that the business engage um, third party risk and procurement once again as early on um, as possible and ideally if you have a seat at the table with the business, like at the beginning of the, um, the fiscal year, we are thinking about what um, the business has on their agenda for the upcoming year, that's an opportunity to get a, um, a sense of what might be coming on or off in the upcoming year as it relates to third parties. And um, the first bullet is key. Um, when Jen and I kind of do our awareness campaign across our firm, it's very much sufficiently time is, is key. If, if the business remembers nothing else, it's that um, engage us as early as possible because um, that way we can be very thoughtful for the future phases that come as a result. And I would say that that lead time is always going to be the time it takes to do the entire life cycle, life cycle is um, going to take longer than you would expect because the biggest, and I'll get into this later, the biggest part of the timeline is the one part you can't control. And that is when you are waiting on the third party to provide you with documentation. You can ping them all you would like, but it all depends on how quickly they're able to internally address the questionnaire, document request, whatever it may be and turn it back. So again, it is critical, as Marcia said, to make sure that you know, we have a seat at the table, that you have a seat at the table as soon as possible. So from a, at this time, when you're speaking with um, the business, you're also um, learning what the vendor is going to do, and you can look at risk identification and scoping exactly what type of risk assessment that you need to do and a risk assessment can be comprised of many different things. So you might, you might do a full blown if there is um, data involved and it's a critical or tier one vendor, you would um, need a lot of documentation. You'd need a lot of information in order for your um, assessment, internal assessment team, we call it a, a, a due diligence team here uh, in, in order for them to assess their respective um, areas of expertise. So you might send, uh, we might send a full SIG, which is the um, shared information gathering tool, or we may send a uh, request just for documentation, or we may send uh, individual questionnaires that we've created internally. Uh, everybody does it differently. Some people create their own questionnaires. Some people solely use the SIG. There are other, other types of questionnaires out there as well and processes. It's whatever works for your firm. Um, and then from, uh, from once we decide the scope of the assessment, uh, the ranking is done a little bit later um, during um, the intake process. But we are looking at during that whole time uh, what type of vendor is coming in and what type of, um, we're always looking down the road to try and make it a more efficient onboarding process and through the entire contract process as well. At this point in time, when we're, we're finding out what the vendor does, we are working in tandem. Third party risk is working in tandem with the contract people and enterprise sourcing. And I will say, I have, um, this is a unique for me to have uh, third party risk and the enterprise sourcing procurement people. Um, under the same team. We're basically all things vendor. Uh, in my prior role elsewhere, um, that was not the case. We, we didn't talk much uh, between the contract people and third party risk. So this definitely uh, is a, a very advantageous situation where we can leverage information and um, be able to effectively and hopefully efficiently onboard the vendor with little pain to the vendor and to the business. A, a question 
Do you do you think that's unique to Wellington, or are you seeing a trend in that direction where enterprise sourcing and risk management are be, are becoming much more integrated? So, I have seen it. I was at a, a recent industry event. Uh, there are some other firms that are moving towards it. They've found the same benefits that we have, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a trend. But from a broader mm -hmm. picture, um, John may have a, a, a better sense of how um, the firms are structured. Uh, thank you, Jen. Yeah, we're, we're starting to see it move in that direction. And if it's not a formal move of third party risk into a procurement function or a first line, and there's a requirement for a separation between the first and second lines, we're seeing much more cooperation, sharing of platform, sharing of systems. So, so I think we're seeing that starting to work together where the procurement folks and the risk folks and the, the, the control groups are really working together to a common goal. And Thank I you, John. And I think for the, please go ahead. I was just going to say, this is Marsh. I was just going to add that I think it makes for easier communication with the business to have kind of one voice throughout the process, shepherding them through the due diligence and the contract negotiation. When that becomes too disjointed, it can cause some confusion um, from the business perspective. Mm. And I think for the audience, I just wanted to add a little bit also that, you know, John Brie, who was also speaking before, he also brings with him a background from Citibank and Deutsche Bank, where he was the head of third party risk and vendor management. So we have three experts here that have significant experience, not just in third party risk, but how they're engaging with enterprise sourcing. Um, I, know, I know you have a few other comments you wanted to make on this page, but let me just ask a question before we move further. So when I think about Wellington, this private independent investment management firm with over 1 trillion in assets, uh, acts as an investment advisor to over 2,000 plus institutions in 60 plus countries, so massive spread. So when you think about this planning phase and when you engage, is there a certain threshold below which you don't engage or some kind of a standard that you use in terms of risk or criticality of a third party that you absolutely have to be at the table? So I will tell you that um, all of our vendors, we would like, we're eventually, um, we're working towards becoming the owner of the master vendor list for the firm. And that would include all vendors that are actually paid and not paid, which is why AP um, is not um, for this purpose going to be considered the authoritative source for the master vendor list. I would say generally speaking that we are involved, whether it's vendor risk or the contract people, the enterprise sourcing people, there may be a contract that has nothing, no need for vendor oversight or vendor involvement, third party risk involvement. So between the two of us, I would say that we, what we leave with the businesses globally, we speak to risk committees, we speak at any, um, at any forum that they would invite us to, we would love to, to share this information. They uh, know to come to us basically for anything that they want to do when they engage a vendor. Right now, we haven't instituted a threshold per se. Uh, I will say that we are looking at creating um, a template or uh, mm -hmm. a, a plan, a procedure for low dollar items that can be managed locally across the globe, but we're not there yet from a global perspective. But right now, there isn't a threshold. Everything right now would come through third-party risk or contracts through enterprise sourcing. Got it. Got it. Thank you. So, John, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about any other screenings on this from a planning perspective, if you wanted to add anything before I go to the next page. Just a comment, Jen. I think the, the industry, and, and, and you've kind of made this point, is, is heading towards uh, getting identification and information as early in the life cycle as possible. Because the more you learn up front, the, the easier it makes the process going forward. And I think when you 
talk about due diligence now, I think that that's an important component of how it's, it's critical that we roll information forward. You know, nothing is isolated. So what you learn in an RFI and what you learn in RFP and what you learn in due diligence should all continue to roll forward and, and be used down the road. And back to you. That's a good point. So with respect to due diligence, uh, this clearly is in the, in the life cycle. This clearly can be the most time consuming part of the process. Not all, at least in our firm, not every service goes out for RFP. An RFP is an exception versus the rule here. We will enter into contracts with a lot of third party providers, service providers. The industry, like many, the asset management industry uh, outsources a lot of activities to. Um, for a variety of reasons. So what we do is, um, I'm gonna to speak to it from a non-RFP perspective generally. So when we start to um, hear that a vendor uh, would like to come on board, and this is done in tandem, a service level risk assessment is done. And that's where we start. It may be unique to our firm. Some firms do it at the vendor level, but the service level is we believe is closer to the risk, the actual risk. So that's why we do it at the service level. We use a tool that uh, houses all of our vendors, all of the data related to the vendors, as well as all of the documentation from an internal control perspective that is housed within that tool. And you may have one vendor with multiple services. We have several vendors with more than a dozen services. And those services are uniquely assessed for risk, both at the inherent level and the residual level. And inherent risk, just in case everyone's not there, inherent risk is the risk before controls and residual risk is after consideration of controls. So we will look at it, the tool looks at the inherent and will calculate the inherent and then the residual risk after we do our due diligence. And uh, I don't think this is um, unique to our firm. I know it was in my prior firm as well. Due diligence, when we gather all the documentation, we have a team of subject matter as experts across the firm. Uh, in particular, information security, business continuity, disaster recovery, compliance, finance, insurance, just to name a few, it is not, I don't think that is unique because we cannot be SMEs for everything. We help coordinate the program and make sure uh, there's a framework for which uh, vendors are onboarded and we, the firm complies with uh, the regulations. So all the information comes in and those SMEs will review, and this is all within the tool, those SMEs will review the documentation. So information security will look at, and we traditionally ask for a SOC 2 type 2 report. The breadth of information will depend solely these days. Clearly, if they are a firm that gathers, processes, is given any type of data for employees or clients, they, there's a lot of due diligence that is done about the robust, robustness of the um, data protection controls. If there's no data involved, if, if it clearly is, say, uh, a conference or we're having an offsite for all the investment personnel or um, local uh, area holiday events, those are pure contracts other than trying to make sure that the they have appropriate insurance from a liability perspective, no other due diligence is done. Those are the easy ones. Those are the quick, it goes through Marsha's team of uh, enterprise sourcing contract professionals. They work with the business, that's all set. But if there's any data, so if you look at the larger um, service providers, say in the investment management area, 
you are, we are doing a very robust due diligence on all of the documentation that they can provide, and that can last quite a while. So as noted here, we, we get down to the level of the type of data being touched by the vendors, the nature of the service, how it's protected, what the disaster recovery plans are. We um, use an external source to determine the financial and assess the financial health of the company that we're contracting with. Uh, we are also documenting if we are going to be subject to any new regulatory requirements based on where that third party is located. So there is a lot of information and I could go on and on as far as we're looking at their governance structure, we're looking at, um, sometimes we do go out for a physical operational site visit. I know as of the last 12 to 18 months, the trend has been to do virtual office visits or virtual site visits. Um, I know that that is uh, becoming more common, but there are instances, especially when you're entering into large strategic enterprise relationships that nothing will nothing will solve anything better than being on site to look at uh, certain controls. It's a trust but verify. And then this last bullet about establishing standards for the vendor selection process, that is typically done when you have more than one vendor, when you are looking at larger processes with respect to you've used an RFP in order to um, gather all the information. And if they do not meet certain criteria, could be how they're protecting the data or not protecting the data, then they will come right out of consideration. There are certain things that um, we won't compromise on and we won't, we can't, if we can't get comfortable with it, we'll just take them out of contention for being considered for the business. No, I think this is this is a I think this is a good um, point for the participant in today because I think many in the industries that the IOP members are that there has been a move towards due diligence that was more based on attestation and I think what's happening is particularly with all the cyber issues, data privacy issues, GDPR, and others. We're getting to a point now where companies are starting to go back and say, if it is a strategic deal, uh, significant touch to their networks and or their data, that they need to actually verify these and no longer, the attestation is no longer enough. And that may um, be comprised of bringing everybody together. So what we've started here, we are literally at the initial stages, for certain key strategic third parties, we are, to make it more efficient for the third party and for us, we're bringing all the business owners from all of the relationships with that one vendor, both sides, and going over some of this from a due diligence perspective. I know I'm getting into the next step about um, performance oversight and monitoring, but we're gonna bring them all in to validate certain things and also just discuss how things are going from a performance perspective, any common service level agreements, um, just so it can, instead of having say 12 different meetings with some of the same people with SMEs, we're gonna try and make it more efficient for both sides of the table, for both sides of the relationship. And I think that's important because due diligence is clearly critical in this. So with respect to contract negotiation, obviously a critical phase of the life cycle and, and the primary objective there is to make sure that the contract language is mitigating any identified risks where possible. And so the more that third party risk and procurement processes are intertwined, um, the easier that gets because as Jen mentioned before, the contract managers are um, following the due diligence as it's happening so they understand some of the risks that are shaking out early in the process can already be thinking about the contract provisions that might need to be inserted to address some of those early findings. Um, we 
um, you know, our posture is that obviously we don't want to sign a contract um, prior to due diligence being complete, but there are exceptions to that. And in those cases, um, we do think about mitigating terms in the contract to allow for, you know, certain termination provisions if upon the completion of due diligence, there are some concerns that we just can't mitigate or get comfortable with, um, making sure we have an out contractually. But that's where our team sitting together side by side really help with that process and make it more um, streamlined and efficient once again to the business they don't kind of see all the inner workings they just see the output at the end um, and that's what we like um, to happen so with respects to um, just i'll highlight some of the specific um, contract provisions where we tend to spend um, our time um, first and foremost it's towards the bottom of the list but confidentiality with all the data privacy rules and regulations, we spend a lot of time here really understanding what the data is, um, how is the vendor gonna safeguard it, the contractual safeguards you wanna put in place um, to the extent you know, G it's subject to GDPR, making sure we feel we've got adequate um, language in the contract, processor versus controller, that, um, that we're meeting our obligations um, based on the global um, privacy standards and so we spend a lot of time there thinking about data breach notifications and how would that work and and making sure that um, everything's buttoned up in the contract with respects to um, audit rights um, we take it a little bit further than that and audit rights really extend to also having um, the right contractual that we can perform due diligence on the vendor and contractually holding the vendor accountable to complying with our due diligence request and and complying to completing our questionnaires and providing supplemental documentation you know where reasonable and so that's something that has been a win for us over the last um, few years inserting that into contracts so that um, it just it makes it easier when the due diligence process rolls around that we know contractually they're obligated to um, to work with us in getting our um, due diligence efforts complete um, with respects to um, third parties really this is kind of I think about it in terms of fourth parties so you know uh, based on the nature of the service, making sure that they're not going to be sub-delegating out their responsibilities to another party, um, and either contractually saying they can't without um, written approval, or you know if they want to strike that, then it means that they probably are planning to or already do so. So just making sure that we understand, you know, just because we're hiring them to provide a service, what are they then on the back end outsourcing, and and how do we feel about that? And is there another step of due diligence that needs to be done as a result of that? So those are questions that we ask, kind of just based on um, putting language in, seeing what they strike, and then figuring out, um, you know, talking through some of the red lines and understanding um, more the risk based. Um, you know where, where they're coming from there with respects to tracking contractual obligations so um, I think some of you may have a tool we, we recently implemented a tool to help um, not only just serve as a document repository for our vendor contracts but also being able to track obligations um, termination provisions the right to terminate how many days notice do you have to give limitation liability insurance language so we've been tracking those obligations just so it's easier to report on and search um, and so that's been um, we're early days into our tool but that's been an early win for us and um, specifically when we when we think about limitation and liability and insurance you know we often have the conversation on our team you know we'll be fighting for insurance limits but then when you look about when you look at the limitation liability you've actually in a previous provision have limited your liability such that you know the five million professional liability insurance doesn't really matter because you limited it to one year fees paid in a different provision so really just trying to think about the contract um, not provision by provision but as a whole and making sure we understand where those interdependencies are so that we're not fighting for something in one spot but it's um, it really is not applicable because we lost something out in a different area um, so hope that resonates and I would just I mean we're getting the the with the tool that we recently implemented we've started receiving more requests to need search capabilities so um, that's allowed us to be able to search across the platform for particular contract provisions and our searches are coming in from a lot of different requests from across the business so um, 
For those who don't have search capabilities, it just might be something you think of on your radar that um, particularly with respects to being able to respond to any type of audit requests um, and the like, search capabilities may become more of a requirement in the future. And I think just to add to what you were talking about, you know, the graphic that you see on the page, and uh, I'll be curious to hear more of your comments. Uh, I think you made a very good point. While we're seeing increased focus on security provision, cyber provision, and along with that, a much greater attention to insurance because some of that risk is being mitigated by insurance. But on the flip side, because in many areas, innovation uh, such as new automation is happening so fast that clients are looking for more flexibility in their contracting and also the ability to continue to access innovation without having to open up the contract. Um, and any comment or any observations on that that, that I just talked about? Do you have an example where you'd have to open up the contract for the innovation? Just like, so I can think about cloud, like this is a little bit, we're beyond this, but yeah. like when we yeah. think about, um, you know, when we're negotiating contract terms now, we do try to think about things where we um, have learned from maybe previous mistakes when you can't really predict what's gonna be in the future. So for instance, cloud, right? There, there were some historic contracts that didn't allow, um, the platform to go to the cloud, the service to go to the cloud. And so how do we be, you know, how just, it goes back to being smarter now up front, thinking about um, those obligations that we're reading in a contract to make sure that, you know, we don't exactly know where we're gonna be in the future and where the, the technology is gonna go, but trying to make sure, yeah, the infrastructure is not being limited in the contract. Does that answer your question? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, in some of the areas, for example, you know, we're seeing particularly around automation, you know, so one of our clients recently in in a function that's focused in the insurance industry around claims management and working with a provider to enable bots to automate a number of manual processes. And in their case, what they originally thought might be 50 or 75 potential uses, they're up to over 300 plus now. And so the ability at which the supplier has been able to automate so they've been able to use significantly less people to do the work, but that's not what the original contract had contemplated. So now, you know, I think what they're trying to do with the client is to say, we need more flexibility. Both, both sides need more flexibility in the contracting process that as things go better than expected, you can either share the benefits or make sure the contract is such that the provider is not penalized because they actually automated even more so. Yes. Yep. And having, in some cases too, part of it is, you know, you're going to have efficiency gains and thinking about that at the start of the contract to make sure, yeah, you know, who's going to right. benefit from that. Yep. And the other thing I would just add once again, um, just on the tool piece, um, because we have to work off vendor paper and it's not always um, our preferred Wellington paper, the, we have ability to create a clause library and that's where we're kind of storing all of our um, provisions, you know, the best language, what's, you know, the next best. And so that we've got a place to kind of grab and go and so that we're being consistent um, with our language across contracts where we can be. Right. Okay, so on um, continuous, continuous monitoring, so the biggest thing that I would um, want you to take away from this is you don't want to overclub something. Everyone is so busy. Um, you want to make sure that whatever requirements you establish with respect to ongoing monitoring is that they are commensurate with the level of risk and the complexity of the relationship. Now that can change obviously over time as you learn new things or if there's some sort of breach with the, um, with the vendor, but you really should uh, lay out in advance what types of vendors based on how you, how you tier them um, or whatever you use for a ranking, what type or what tiering number will equate to the level of ongoing monitoring. The biggest thing here is that Ultimately, as a third party risk professional or an enterprise sourcing professional, we don't own the vendors. The business level 
is responsible and owns the vendor. They needed to bring that third party in in order to get their work done. That process was necessary. So you need to have a partnership with the business. It is crucial to develop that relationship and have a good working relationship. We also want to make sure that we are, they know, they know the business. We don't to the degree that they do. We want to make sure that we are monitoring. They are monitoring at a certain level, which they do. There's SLAs, et cetera, depending on the type of vendor, but that the monitoring that we do is commensurate with the risk profile of the vendor. So we, we won't do any monitoring for say somebody that um, a hotel that we might have conferences in, or we have meetings in several times a year. We won't do any monitoring with that. But for say a custodian, a global custodian, we would, uh, or a transfer agent, that monitoring is basically done daily by the business. The interaction is there. There are uh, periodic meetings um, with a broader group, say on a monthly basis between the business and the third party. And then the higher level monitoring, we would, if it's a top tier vendor, third party, we would then do something on a 12 to 18 month cycle. With the number of vendors that we have here, uh, we would not be able to, it'd be difficult to get through everybody in a 12 month period. So 12 to 18 months rolling, I think is appropriate. The only thing when you get out of that, so 18 to 36 might be the next level. As you go up in the tiers, we only have four tiers here. Uh, you may move someone from the highest, so a four, the lowest tier, to down to a two um, if services change. Is it me or just we, did we just lose audio? It's John. I can hear you, but I can't hear Jen. Yeah, Jen and Marsha, we cannot hear you. John, do you want to jump in while they figure out? Uh, yeah. Yes, let me do that. Oh, are they back? Okay. Are you there? Yes, we are. We yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, please. We, we lost you for a little bit. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so all I would say there is that you want to make sure that if there's uh, an incident or a breach or something that causes your vendor to require additional oversight, you may start to look at that more closely on a near-term basis. But that um, monitoring is typically, we, unless absent an issue, you would uh, base all your monitoring on the risk profile. The enhanced oversight, so we have, I'm sure like many of your firms, we have strategic vendor relationships here. And we do enhanced oversight with respect to that. And it may be what I had talked about earlier, it may be bringing all the parties together uh, around the table to talk about the relationship. I will tell you in your roles and in our roles, so third party risk enterprise sourcing, we are uniquely positioned to see one of the only few to see the vendor in its entirety across the enterprise. All of the businesses are focused on their respective relationships. And you may think, the business may think, okay, this vendor is a $300,000 uh, vendor to the firm, when in reality, there's 11 other services and it could be an $8 million, it could be worth $8 million and we're able to leverage that as part of our negotiation with respect to the contract or ongoing monitoring and asking for additional controls. So that is key that we are uniquely positioned with our structure of working together. We're able to see that and that's where we can provide value back to the business. From a, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jen. I'll jump in as soon as you're finished. I was just going to say from a roles and responsibilities perspective, we really cannot underscore enough how important it is that the business understands that they are, they're the first line, they own the vendor, they own the relationship, they should know what's going on, they should be involved um, 
even just from a communication perspective, you can just copy them on um, email correspondence when you're negotiating contract back and forth with the third party. Or if you have any, any other issues with respect to due diligence, you want that vendor owner right next to you side by side because you work as a team um, with respect to bringing on these vendors and the oversight and monitoring. So defining those roles and responsibilities up front is key. Okay, thank you. That, that, was, that was really comprehensive and I think you covered a lot of topics. Uh, just to comment on a couple of things. One is, you know, with, uh, as a tool mentioned earlier with, with the changes in regulation and with uh, more focus on data privacy, breaches, cybersecurity, uh, we have to sort of think about third-party risk, sourcing risk, supply chain risk, actually becoming the AML of the next decade. Um, I think we're going to see regulators, not only in the financial industry, but in other industries, healthcare, pharma, starting to look at the entire supply chain and the sourcing chain. Now, with that in mind, you have to think about the changes that are happening with you know, the rapidly changing environment with Agile. DevOps, uh, AI, machine learning, all the things that are coming, we have to adjust our monitoring and our governance and oversight around those. While risk assessments and due diligence are, are very valuable, we are responsible for the life cycle management and the life cycle risk management. That can only be accomplished successfully through real-time continuous monitoring. Now, you have to be sensitive to the, the levels of risk that Jen mentioned because there are sometimes four or five levels of risk. And, and your monitoring has to be commensurate with that risk, but it also has to be able to change as that risk changes, whether it's the growth of a relationship, uh, a company changing from uh, a manual process to an automated process. So continuous real time across multiple categories. Monitoring just cyber is not the answer. So you need to be able to have a comprehensive view of your third party providers and changes that are happening within their uh, service provision. It's a positive change and a negative change. Not all risk intelligence is bad news. Some of it is good news about one of your vendors has automated, come up with a better way. Maybe it's an opportunity for a renegotiation of a contract. So the importance of real-time continuous risk, that's also you know, curated so that you don't get overwhelmed with false positives. These are the things that you have to think about. And, and that's kind of the direction that we see the kind of life cycle management uh, going in, in the industry. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Atul, because I think we might have a couple of questions. Yeah, so I think, you know, for, I think for all three of you, as you think about this, this is an area that really resonates with the audience that's on the call today, which is the attention that they pay to ongoing vendor management, ongoing governance. And John, you talked about this move to continuous and real time. You know, what kind of organization internally? So if you think about the people, Jen and Marsha, that you're hiring, bringing into these roles, or John, that you, that you see, what kind of skill sets are you looking for, particularly in this area, to enable kind of like this ongoing monitoring of your third party base? Uh, I'll jump in on that one. I think we're, we're really seeing that with, with the overwhelming amount of data, we need people who are, who are comfortable dealing with, with, you know, large sets of data and also who can do analysis and relational metric type things. In other words, you can't just look at an incident. You have to look at, you know, what led up to that incident. Was there, was there a period leading up to it? Can you do pattern matching? So what we're seeing is that they need people with analytical skills who know how to deal again with these various types of data and also not just financial data. It's financial, it's performance, it's cyber, it's uh, you know, risk and control. Where are you with uh, sustainability? How are you with sanction screening? That's becoming a very hot item. Uh, uh, you know, politically exposed persons. All of these things have to be built into this ongoing monitoring because we are responsible as, as relationship owners for the actions ultimately of our vendors. And I would echo that it is, it is, um, we, I just hired somebody in the last six or eight months. And I will tell you that one of the key skill sets that this person 
possessed that has um, been a big win for our team is the ability, the analytical skills, the, abil the ability to gather the data and to analyze it and to use uh, technology in order to um, glean some patterns out of some of the data. And we are working, we're just at the beginning stages, we are working with others across the firm in order to get a broader picture of the vendor. So if there's a, an incident um, somewhere with, say there's a, an error, uh, a trade error somewhere, and you can tie it back to a vendor. And so they will tie that back to the due diligence that we've done. And it's still in the early stages, but we are hoping to get to what we would consider the, a, GR, a full GRC, including our vendor risks as part of that analysis across the firm. Yeah, following up on that quickly, what we're seeing a tool and, 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 and folks in the audience that we're starting to see companies uh, performing or providing services, which is you know, risk analysis as a service where they are gonna be taking external data combined with uh, internal data that's provided by you know, companies and, and being able to show a very clear and quick and concise profile that may indicate a change or a behavioral change. So that's something we're starting to see come along. And I think, like I said, our, you know, our partners at Wellington are, are, are taking a, an internal lead role in that, but we're gonna see it both on the internal side and on the external side. And then no, I know- we, Go ahead. No, please go ahead. Um, I was just gonna, I know we're pressed for time. I didn't know if there were any other questions. No, I, I was just going to say, let's, let's move forward because I know we have a little bit of more data to share and then we'll try to address questions if we have time left. Okay, perfect. So I will say just to kind of tie some things up, reporting for the stakeholders, so for the business uh, relationship owners and for the business in general, senior management is key. And we are able, again, going back to my earlier topic of how we're uniquely positioned, to look at these vendors from an enterprise-wide holistic view, we are able through our tool to be able to provide reporting for these stakeholders, hopefully making it as transparent and self-service oriented as possible, where they'll be able to push a button so we don't have to worry about timing. So say our business in Singapore needs to look at their list of vendors because maybe the local regulator um, is just asking some questions for general education, they can go into the system while we're sleeping here on the East Coast of the United States and get the information that need, they need so we don't need to um, delay their, their information gathering process. And from an escalation perspective, if there are vendors that are being brought on and we get to a point, this is rare by the way, um, we get to a point where we cannot get comfortable with the risk of bringing on the residual risk of bringing on that vendor, we will escalate it, um, whether it's to the head of the business or to the risk committee, uh, which is, uh, this is still, a, still up for discussion as to, as to what the appropriate um, governing body is, but the governance around this and the escalation process to acknowledge and accept risk related to third party risk management is, is, is important. It really is. And one point I, I do want to make, which is new, and I'm not sure how many of you on the call actually do this or your firms do this. Um, the biggest thing in the tool, our new tool, is data integrity for me. I have been such a stickler on validating every data point, both existing that was in the old tool and new stuff that's going in. I will have in the first quarter of this year, have every single business unit, and I think it's a really good practice, I did it in my old firm, the business unit has to confirm accuracy of its vendor list, its vendor inventory, and all of the data elements, the risk data elements associated with it. I think it's very important. They own the vendor, they should be acknowledging um, that they are aware because they're dealing with them every day probably, um, or quite frequently, they're aware of what they're doing, what type of information they process, and they should also be able to tell us if there has been a change in any of that information, how they process the data, 
or if there's a change in the functionality with the service and they just haven't been able to uh, circle back to tell us, or if perhaps the vendor's been terminated, and then that would help as well with respect to um, the contract management side and also keeping the data integrity and the tools accurate. And then I'll just spend a minute quickly on, you know, when we think about renewal and termination. So renewals are typically a little bit easier than termination. Um, but when we think about renewals, it's really trying to make sure that we're staying ahead of what's coming up for renewal, understanding if there's auto renew provisions, how many days notice do we have to give if we um, plan to not renew. Um, and then particularly if it's coming off, you know, a multi-year um, contract period thinking about do we need to beef up some of the contract provisions based on changes in our um, standard language that maybe has evolved over the last you know couple of years since it was um, originally negotiated and so always taking a fresh set of eyes to the contract um, to make sure you know it has a chance when it's coming up for renewal to renegotiate terms if if we need to and then on the termination side um, this is where you know termination becomes easier depending on how the contract was structured from the start. So whenever it's services, thinking about, um, you know, if you've outsourced certain services, what are the transition services that that outgoing vendor will be obligated to provide when you want to move to a new vendor? Um, because we will need their, their help in transitioning. Um, even things like, you know, if the vendor helped us with creating standard operating procedures because they took over a certain function, is that their information? Is that our information? And can we get those back or do we have to recreate those once we terminate the relationship and want to move to a new, a new provider? So just once again, things to think about that we're trying to ask those questions up front with the, with the business to understand um, what we need to put in the contract up front to make the transition easier once we do move to a termination provision. At some point, it's probably going to terminate. And so have that lens when we're structuring the contract to begin with. And I think those are, those are really good points that you talk about. And, and often, many of these provisions you talk about, um, many companies are working to make sure that they're actually in your contract process, right? Especially when you think about transition support uh, and related activity. Yeah, but the tricky part is that last bullet there, right? The disposal of data and, yeah. um, you know, the vendors, you know, our requirement of the vendor to return and destroy the data. Um, you know, yeah. how do you, in many cases, the business owner having to communicate that to the vendor, um, depending when we're brought into the loop. And so just being thoughtful about um, making sure that, that actually happens and having some procedures around that to ensure it actually does take place. So folks, we're, we're getting to the very final minutes of it. So um, I think Marsha and Jenna be helpful to maybe wrap it up. And one of the things we can do is um, if there is questions uh, what I can do is I can get it from Nicole, and uh, I think most of the audience knows that what we end up doing is then posting the answers later on the IOP website. So I, I think we can use the next couple of minutes to actually wrap up uh, this using this final slide. So here, um, I think all we wanted to do is it's basically a wrap up of what we had discussed, and it demonstrates the virtual team that you need to manage third-party risk. You have the business, you have procurement and enterprise sourcing these days, and then the vendor risk, third-party risk team. Everyone has a role, small or large, in all aspects of the vendor process. So that's what we wanted to take away here. And you can see in the key who's core, who's ad hoc as required and just from a notification perspective. But this is a good summary of what we just talked about for the last 50 minutes or so of who's responsible for what. And it can vary in your firms based on your structure, but just fun, from a fundamental perspective, this, this, this works for us. And I would just add that where Jen and I spend a lot of time is educating the business on what their role is. You know, what does it mean to be a relationship owner for a vendor, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a really that's a really good point to reinforce is that this is not uh, 
sourcing or enterprise risk management, going out there, conducting sourcing and mitigating risk, but truly collaborating with business so that their needs are being met and they're fully engaged as you go through this life cycle. Exactly. John, did you want to add anything to this? Third party risk is not a spectator sport. You have to be in it. <laughs> and, and I think that's a, a way to look at it. And I think this slide that uh, Jen and, and Masha provided is excellent. Everybody has a role and you have to play that role. So let me, let me um, maybe quickly summarize uh, and really no better way to summarize than for the audience to know that this deck will be available online at the IOP governance chapter and so that you'll be able to access this. And one of the other things we'll do is we'll collect the questions that you have posed that we were unable to answer and we will also ask Jen and Marsha's help in answering those, and we will post those. But most importantly, Jen, Marsha, and John, thank you so much for being here and actually taking the time to walk the audience through the whole life cycle of sourcing, and more importantly, actually articulating so well for each one of those life cycle stages, how enterprise risk, the business, and sourcing come together to help business recognize those objectives while truly working hard to mitigate the risks that often occur in a life cycle such as this. Thank you again and on behalf of the IOP governance chapter and IOP, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.